have you? Hi, my name is Pablo de Jesus. I'm the executive director of Unitarian Universalists for Social Justice. Um, and we welcome you to USJ's webinar on immigration policy, past, present, and future. We're gonna introduce you to the UUSJ, uh, introduce you to UUSJ and its immigration action team at the beginning of this webinar. Uh, and our intent is to provide a broad background to help bring everyone to a common level of understanding about the context in which immigration decisions have been and are being made. This is one of a two-part series. And though we will entertain informational questions today, we plan to have a more interactive dialogue via a town hall style Zoom on April 28th. We plan to invite a number of advocacy organizations and impacted persons in addition to UUs to that session to help us focus on what priorities could be both in June for our advocacy with Congress and for a more medium term planning horizon. We'll be sharing our current priorities, to, priorities tonight and again in April as the basis for that feedback. We will pause three times for about five minutes of Q&A. You can post your questions in the chat, but please try to focus on listening and don't use the chat for too many other purposes so we can see the incoming questions. You can feel free to raise your hand using the function under the reactions button and try to remember to lower your hand after you've asked your question. We will be sharing the slides that you are seeing this evening after the webinar with all of those who registered. And we'll be sharing more detailed resource guides that include an annex listing 40, over 40 organizations involved in the immigration and refugee advocacy so that you can connect to other organizations in addition to you, USJ. Again, we ask you to be focused and present on the speaker. We suggest that you select the speaker view so that you can always see the person speaking easily. As the audience grows larger, if you're in that Brady Bunch style display, you may not be able to see the slide deck. So with that, we're now on to the show. And I'd like to introduce Charlotte Jones Carroll. She is the convener of our immigration action team and a member of River Road UU congregation. And um, we'll be starting us off this evening. With that, thank you, Charlotte, please. Thanks, Pablo. Thanks, Pablo. And uh, let me add my welcome. I'm Charlotte Jones Carroll. I'll be um, going through quite a few slides here. So I hope I thank you in advance for your patience. Let me mention um, a number of our team. Our immigration action team has about a dozen people. Right now there's Charlene Belson Zilmer, Terry Grogan, Don Cherry, Steve Cox, Gail Boyd. Sean McCarthy, Steve Ekstrand on. I hope I haven't missed anybody. We have um, Josh Leach from the UU Service Committee. Thank you for joining us, Josh. We try to partner with UUSC, which is advocating for the same um, issues that we are. So if we can get going with the next slide, Paulette, and start you in. So let me just take, five minutes to say what we do for those who aren't as familiar, UUs for social justice. Uh, UUSJ has an immigration action team. Uh, we really, um, as a mission for the organization as a whole, we have the 
advancing equitable national policies and actions aligned with UU values through engagement, education, and advocacy. Now, obviously this webinar is part of the education effort. Advocacy is what we're probably better known for. We do a lot of visiting. More recently, it's virtual visiting uh, on Capitol Hill, but and we hope to engage uh, people who are constituents. It really is much, much better to have the constituents uh, interacting on these visits through letters uh, when it's not a pandemic and through actual Zoom meetings when it is. So our action team has been busy doing uh, on immigration and refugee issues, doing advocacy uh, for about six years, a little more than six years. We visit Congress, sometimes virtually. We uh, try to do letter writing. We encourage different uh, issues to be uh, written in constituent letters. We uh, more recently have been doing action alerts and we provide briefings as part of the educational background for the advocacy to, uh, to use individually and as congregations. Um, just to let you know, in the last two years or so, we have focused on pathways. I'm going to use a few acronyms here. If you don't know them, I will come back, but DACA is our, our the, and TPS are ones that I'll refer to a lot. DACA, of course, are the dreamers, the people who came in as children and uh, got this special program status and temporary protected status people uh, I'll talk again about later. But we've been really trying to advocate for getting legal status for these for several years now. We've also, of course, opposed the separation of children from their families. Uh, we'll talk about that later. We've talked about using alternatives to detention for asylum seekers so they're not putting everybody into ICE jails. We uh, recently were seeking reductions in the budgets of the enforcement agencies, ICE and CBP, that's, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Customs and Border, uh, I say Border Patrol, but uh, they, those also we asked about uh, immigrants had been left out of COVID relief recently in the various bills that had passed in the past years, but uh, we have been asking that they be included because of course the COVID virus doesn't distinguish by citizenship status. So. We have uh, used a, a number of, of efforts. We've joined faith-based coalitions and petitions as well as trying to visit Congress. We sign on to petitions and to letters and onto amicus briefs to advocate for better treatment. Just before we leave this slide, I wanna point out that this picture here is a uh, visit exactly a year ago, March 10th, when we were in the Senate advocating for uh, legalization of temporary protected status persons. And the gentleman in this picture, Ulises Ramirez is a TPS status holder who joined us. It's much better to have an impacted person. He was able to tell his story as a small business owner who has US citizenship children, who employs US citizens, and but who is not able to grow his business much because of the uncertainty of his status. Can, next slide, please. That we think it's very important to center impacted people, and we've been working on ways to do that to try to listen to the immigrants and refugees and understand their needs and goals. But we do need to decide our priorities in the context of UU values. So when we pay attention to advocacy organizations led by impacted people, we also pay attention to our principles, in particular, uh, the two first and second principles, one about the inherent worth and dignity of every person and the other about justice, equity and compassion and human relations are what guide us. Uh, as Pablo mentioned, we partner or monitor with over 40 organizations who provide, there's some are service providers, people who, uh, organizations like Raises in Texas that work on the border receiving immigrants, uh, others, American Immigration Council do both advocacy and research and uh, many others, UUSC among them, and UUSJ organize witness events. In other words, rallies or protests or demonstrations. Uh, and we have hosted people also who come to Washington for those events. So next slide, please. As uh, Pablo mentioned, uh, the resource guide that we'll be sending in addition to these slides has an annex that includes the names and websites of those organizations. So I'm gonna take a little time. I think it's very important that we understand the history of US immigration legislation. 
uh, it's, it really shows, you can see what's happening in the country by just looking at this naturalization, uh, immigration and naturalization and refugee uh, legislation history. So just after we became a nation, we of course had to figure out and make a law about what the basis for citizenship was. And at that time, 1790, the first Naturalization Act, it was any free white person of good character who had resided in the US for at least two years. So that's, uh, now there's been a whole lot of, a whole long period that, uh, doesn't have many laws about it because why was that? It was the states for a long time that were actually making their own laws about who could come in or, or who got kicked out. Um, but eventually, and of course that was a period where actually we really wanted labor. We wanted, we, the United States needed labor for to grow its economy, to do work, to settle the land. Um, we needed to, uh, and invited this, during this period, there were a lot of um, English, Scottish, Irish who would come. They sometimes came as indentured servants. They sometimes, mainly there were Europeans though, who were coming in. So there were, there were many decades there where there wasn't any particular control. But by 1864, the federal government began to establish uh, itself as the federal policy uh, overseer. And the first commissioner of immigration was actually in the State Department, which made sense at the time. Um, states probably continued to do some of their own thing. And finally, the Supreme Court in 1875 made it very clear that only the federal level got to decide on immigration policy. So it was beginning to consolidate. Now, you know, we were building the railroad across the country. We were, there was the gold rush. There were a lot of Chinese workers who, who came in or were brought in to do a lot of work, but suddenly we decided that we didn't like them. And so there was in 1882, uh, one of the first kind of nativist anti-immigrant decisions. And that was the Chinese Exclusion Act, which barred any further Chinese from entering. And then a decade after that, there was the first comprehensive immigration law in 1891. Uh, where the Treasury Department became, rather than the State Department, became the main place of regulating immigration. Now it was already regulating customs, so it made sense to regulate immigration. And they sent staff to ports of entry. They began uh, deciding who could come in. So criminals and sick people were not allowed in. Later, there were a lot more things, uh, conditions that barred people from entry, but we'll get to that in a minute. And it actually provided for deportation of people that they decided were in the US illegally. So um, in, in this period, you know, there was a whole lot for just as an example, Ellis Island, one of the main ports of entry between 1892 and 1954, 12 million immigrants entered just through that one port of entry, mostly from Southern and Eastern Europe. So you're talking Italy, Yugoslavia, and others. Um, we can move to the next slide, Pilep. Some of the later um, bans, just to add that uh, later laws barred anarchists, beggars, epileptics, traffickers, they were all barred. And then there was a subsequent act, which I'll uh, get to in a minute, which barred other Asians, the Indians, Southeast Asians, and even Middle Easterns were considered Asians from that point of view. So there was a period of increasing nativist uh, anti-immigrant feeling, and that combined with uh, the eugenics movement. A very interesting book, if you want to read about the eugenics movement, which was supported by some of the leading names of the time. Um, is The Guarded Gate by Daniel Okrent, a recent book called The Guarded Gate, gives you a lot more, but that's the background of uh, first several attempts in the 1920s and finally the 1924 Johnson Reed Act, which created the national origin quota system for letting people in. And they, the idea was to let in 2% per nationality of 
2% of, of the population that was already in the US based on censuses. But they decided instead of using the 1920 or even the 1910 or even the 1900 census as the basis, because all those Southern and Central and Eastern Europeans had been coming in, they went back to 1890, where it was mainly uh, Anglos and Germans and Scotch and Irish who were here. So they used it, that 1890 census, an old one, in order to favor Northern and Western Europeans. So that act, I'll start listing the presidents who signed it, because you'll see that there's, um, there's really no Republican or Democrat side that, that made more difficult immigration issues. It's, a, it's been a mixture. Anyway, so this Johnson Reed Act set the status for, for many decades, national origin quota system. However, World War II hit and there were major labor shortages. So we had to do something. They established a Bracero Agreement to bring in Mexican labor and they repealed the Chinese Exclusion Act so that they could have Chinese laborers as well. So those people came in. And then of course, at the end of World War II, uh, we had, sorry, just let me get the last one there. Uh, the first Refugee Resettlement Act in 1948. This was basically focused on Europe. It allowed over 200,000 displaced Europeans and another 15,000 Europeans who are already here could adjust their status to become permanent residents. Now that actually, that might look like a lot, but that was actually still way too low for Jewish refugees who needed to be resettled. Um, this, this was the um, beginning of refugee resettlement and later we'll see some uh, broadening of that with others. I understand that President Truman was reluctant, but he did sign it. He was reluctant because he recognized that it was going to keep out a number of Jewish refugees who desperately needed to, to come in. Okay, next slide, please. Now there was a, one of the big comprehensive acts was the 1952 Immigration Nationality Act. It consolidated a lot of laws, but it continued those national origin quotas. It just added some Asian nations. And uh, that was, basically changed only in 1965, just before that new uh, Immigration Nationality Act, there was the Cuban Revolution. So President Kennedy signed a bill, basically focused on Western Hemisphere. You know, for a long time, it was very focused on Europeans, our, our immigration laws, and we kind of didn't care. In fact, in the early years, as most of you know, half of the, what we think of as the US was, was Mexican. You know, it only became US Southern border uh, well into the late 1800s. So Asian, the, the Kennedy uh, Migration Refugee Assistance Act was very specifically focused on helping nationals fleeing fear of persecution because of their political opinion. In other words, they weren't agreeing with Castro and being communist, they were free to come to Florida where I grew up, so I knew a lot of them. So this was basically aimed at helping Cubans. Um, I will jump on ahead there in 1975 under Ford, there were uh, uh, other laws similarly aiding people fleeing Vietnam and Cambodia, all places where we had uh, a position or presence that and, and created a certain fear of persecution on the part of Vietnamese and Cambodians that, who had been supporting US involvement. But the next, 1965, under President Johnson, there was this new INA, Immigration and Nationality Act. It replaced the national origin quotas uh, with a whole new set of visas. And I'll talk in detail about what this meant a little later, but based on family reunification, in other words, helping relatives of people who were already here and meeting this country's economic skilled labor needs. So that, 1965 law is actually the one that we are still, over 50 years later, that we are still following because there hasn't really been a comprehensive bill replacing it. If anything, it's been tightened and tightened and tightened, as we'll see. Okay, next slide, please. Um, I think of Jimmy Carter as our human rights president. Um, 
after in 1951, before we get to Carter in 1981, but after World War II, you know, there was the Declaration of Universal Human Rights, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 1951 Convention, a very Europe focused again, because it was after World War II. Uh, and subsequently brought into kind of worldwide in 1967 protocol, but this was the basis for the international system of refugees. So this definition that we incorporated in our internal laws only in 1980, uh, we were participants in the international laws for um, several decades before this. But the definition is a person with well-founded fear of persecution on account of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or membership in a group having a particular opinion, political opinion usually. So this is, uh, this definition had been around since 51 and 67 and generally applied. It was incorporated by Carter and particularly uh, adapted because of the end of the Vietnamese war, the Vietnam War. So he, this was uh, especially focused on the Vietnamese. Now, in 1985 with Reagan, we started tightening the screws and tightening the screws. The Immigration Reform and Control Act, IRCA, increased border control. Uh, it uh, began to use employers to implement uh, the legality of the uh, immigrants. So employers were potentially sanctioned if they hired unauthorized immigrants. There was a program because the Bracero program had ended in 64. There was a new program with visas that are called H2 for agricultural workers. But interestingly, there was an amnesty for 2.7 million people who undocumented people residing in the US. So even if we're talking now about 11 million undocumented, there was already under Reagan in 1985, a regularization of their status, meaning they became legal lawful residents, uh, having been here for some time without authorization. There were various acts, uh, 88, 90, 94, 96, under various presidents that tightened and tightened these uh, criminal bars as they're called to uh, that made for either inadmissibility or grounds for deportation, aggravated felony. Uh, and at the same time, by the way, the immigration courts are under Department of Justice. They're not part of the judiciary branch of the US. They are under Department of Justice, the executive branch. So, but they had had some judicial discretion to give relief from deportation to people who had explanations of why they might have been considered a aggravated felon. So, and, they, that judicial discretion was tightened and they were you know, not ended entirely, but it was made it much more difficult for judges to decide at their own discretion. Next slide. Um, just to let you know this temporary protected status I mentioned that we started in 1990 actually. So it's already 30, over 30 years old. It was created as a very time bound permit to stay in the US. It had to be extended. It might be 18 months or two years at a time. It had to be extended. So people who were in the US who were nationals of country that faced armed conflict, or civil conflict or environmental disasters like hurricanes and earthquakes, which both of which happened recently in Haiti or other extraordinary conditions. The US government could declare that country, designate that country as one which had uh, the extraordinary conditions that allowed, that would require or permit the nationals from that country to stay in the US lawfully. So that started in about three decades ago. Now let's come to Clinton's IRA IRA. This 1996 act really tightened traditional. Uh, the bars to, uh, to criminal bars to entry. What does that mean? That means if you uh, if you had any uh, felony, but even more several a number of uh, misdemeanors, you began to be uh, ineligible, inadmissible. Even if you went home and tried to apply to come back, uh, the scope of judicial review is further reduced. Uh, and then mandatory detention, which was really critiqued by the uh, international law people, because to inter in an international law, 
detention should be used only in the last resort, but we made mandatory detention under this particular law, 1996, uh, for those convicted of such offenses in the United States. We also, under that law, we reduced public benefits for uh, immigrants. We further strengthened, we're always strengthening border controls. We made it harder to apply for asylum. We started monitoring exit as well as entry of immigrants and this e-verify program, if you've heard about it. So employers had already been asked to make sure that the employees were lawfully here. An e-verify program gave them a tool to use. And what's now fairly infamous, something called the 287G program. Remember, federal government is supposed to be the one that executes and implements immigration policy and law. But this gave local law enforcement, sheriff's office, police departments, certain responsibilities for immigration enforcement. If those local law enforcement agencies sign an agreement with ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Uh, this 1996 law also established expedited removal. Um, that means that people could be physically removed for various reasons without the normal process of hearing before an immigration judge. Okay, next slide, please. Uh -oh. We seem to have lost our slides, Paulette. Um, well, I'm going to just talk until Paulette gets them back up, hopefully. I can also put them back up if I'm allowed to share. Um, but there were, thanks, there were uh, various laws that provided for deportation relief for Nicaraguans, Salvadorans, Guatemalans. And remember at the end of the 1990s, thanks, if you can go to slide nine. Okay, stop, stop, come back, thanks. All right, if you remember in the late in the 1990s, the Soviet Union fell apart and uh, there were a number of former Soviet bloc countries, uh, as well as another round of Cubans, Marielitos, and they were, so there were various laws that provided for deportation relief and Nicaraguans and Salvadorans uh, had their own situation. Salvadorans, the civil war had occurred and, and also the Nicaraguans had happened in the 1980s. But, uh, so um, we had also Haitians were uh, provided deportation relief. But then what happened? Well, 9-11 happened. And we really went into a foxhole mentality. So under George W. Bush, Bush II, as I call it here, the USA Patriot Act, Patriot Act was uh, passed pretty quickly after 9-11, and it broadened uh, grounds for exclusion to include terrorism. And then that, in 2002, there was the consolidation in the Department of Homeland Security, which was created at that time by that law, consolidating Customs and Border Control and Immigration, and uh, FEMA, which is Emergency Management and Cybersecurity, all in the Department of Homeland Security. Um, there was a further attempt by George W. to establish as close as we will ever get probably to a national ID card. They wanted to have um, state issued driver's licenses of a certain quality so that if they could stat verify the legal status of lawful status of everybody who has issued a driver's license. Now states resisted that for years, and, but it's finally being implemented. I know Maryland just implemented a couple of years ago this. Um, but of course, we also added more border security as we did in 2006, again with George Bush, where law mandated 700 miles of border fence and uh, more high technology to control unauthorized entry. Okay, I'm almost finished with this. I'll do a couple more slides if you can move on to the next one and then we'll, we'll um, stop for questions and answers. And all this time, remember it was 1965, the law that we were still using, the basic comprehensive immigration law, the 1965 one that Lyndon Johnson signed. Now that doesn't mean that they didn't try. Comprehensive immigration reform bills were introduced by McCain and Kennedy in 2005, by Specter in 2006, and another in 2007. The DREAM Act of sign, one form or another was, uh, was a various times tried to be passed to give the children who came in 
unlawfully with parents, but whose fault it wasn't, but it was never passed. Um, in an attempt to get them passed, almost always it was balancing pathways, the pro-immigrant pathways to citizenship and increased legal immigration pro-business with strengthened enforcement. So there was always kind of a balance of these three trying to get the business community to support, the uh, immigration advocacy you know, groups to support and the uh, um, border enforcers. I won't say Republicans because as we saw that was part of every every government, uh, every administration. In 2013, that was the most recent attempt and we've been going back to, a, to that quite a bit. There was the gang of eight in the Senate who got it actually through uh, 68 to 32 in the Senate, it was passed, but it was never taken up by John Boehner in the House because at that point, the Republicans were moving towards the Tea Party. <clears throat> and some surprising people lost their House seats and that was, kind of the end of that. But we still go back to that as a kind of a touchstone for what might be in uh, current comprehensive reform. Of those gang of eight, Menendez, Schumer, Bennett, and Durbin were the Democrats, and they're all still in the Senate. Rubio and Graham are still in the Senate, and all of those are active in one way or another on immigration reform. John McCain, of course, died, and Jeff Flake did not continue in the Senate. So the gang of eight has kind of become a gang of six, but other people have taken it up, and there are some very important pro-immigrant people in the in, in Congress. I'll do one more slide, immigration actions under Obama, if you wanna to move to that, Paulette. Uh, and then we'll stop for Q&A. So Obama, in his first term, he actually did uh, try to begin focus on uh, enforcement only for terrorists and national security threats. And he tightened that later, but he got, tired of waiting for unsuccessful DREAM Acts and he um, created by executive order DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, so that children who were brought in without authorization when they were younger than 16 could be protected from deportation indefinitely. Uh, and that has continued, although it was challenged and uh, attempted to be ended by Trump, but we'll get to that in a minute. At the same time, Obama, attempted to try the same thing for parents of US citizen children and lawful and green card children, basically, something called DAPA. But this was immediately um, challenged by the courts, the Texas courts in particular, and uh, it didn't ever take effect and was later canceled by Trump. Uh, but as I was saying in 2014, there was a, a formalization of the guidelines for our enforcement agencies, ICE and CBP, so that um, the first priority, the highest priority was for terrorists, national security threats, convicted gang members, felons, and always those innocent souls who are attempting to cross the border unlawfully. So people who were coming across could be immediately sent back, but everybody else, 98% in 2016, Obama's last year, 98% of removals were from this category of high uh, crime people, the gang members, felons, and uh, terrorist and national security threats. So they really focused uh, removals on those priority people. So let's stop here for a moment, and I might turn it over to my friend and colleague, Terry Grogan. Uh, if you have been, have any questions to ask or put any in the chat by now, uh, we have several people here that will try to answer them. There, Charlotte and Terry, there was one question, and that was, what does scope of judicial review refer to? Does anyone, uh, this is Terry, does anyone on the team want to take that on? I don't know, uh, Sean, if this is something you're familiar with. Uh, um, scope of ju judicial review, I, I can't remember the context this came up in, but basically that means uh, what... Uh, what a court, what court, uh, the court is allowed to review, you know, can it review X, Y, or Z, or only A and B? Uh, so it, the scope is how broad the judicial review can be. What what can it include? What can it not include? Thank you. Another question is, when did ICE come into being? So that was the just well. I mean, there was a version beforehand of uh, border control of uh, customs enforcement, 
and another one of immigration, but these ICE became ICE in uh, 2002 with the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. We, we can also mention there was an initial question that to Pablo answered, but for those who might not have been here at the time, it's a question that often comes up in these kind of forums. When will we send notes, contacts, et cetera, afterwards? And Pablo pointed out that we will send a copy of the slides that Charlotte's working for, from, as well as a very detailed uh, background piece that she prepared that goes into more information on this history, including a list of a number of organizations, I think there are 40 or so that uh, we think are some of the more prominent ones doing advocacy and information and legal work. So that will go out to everybody um, at some point afterwards. Um, so people are welcome to submit questions in the chat. And I'd like to look for, for raised hands, but I'm limited in doing that right now by both being on an iPad and also having the um, screen filled with the presentation. So if some of the folks who have hands raised, I may not be able to see you, maybe someone else can. Um, I'm looking, oh. I'm looking. Okay, we are and, open. To oh. And I, I just point out to folks, you can raise an electronic hand by going to reactions and pressing raise your hand or going to the chat, sorry, the participant list and clicking on the dots and, and, and saying, raise my hand. I think that's where it is. So. Well, you'll have a, a couple more opportunities. So if there's no questions, questions right now, right. I will, I will oh dear. move on to the next slide. Okay, I hope my echo is stopped. Let's take just a, a brief time out. And if you don't know, so we're still back in our 1965 Comprehensive Act, right? So this is how our immigration system is working now, is supposed to work now. Legal permanent entry can uh, uh, occur if in several categories, but there's 675,000 visas allowed annually. Most of them for family-based, for family reunification relatives, close relatives of people who are in the US, either as uh, legal residents or as citizens. Also employment-based visas. Then there's a category which I'll go into more detail about later, diversity visas, which intend to um, encourage people to come by lottery from countries that are very limited in representation in this country, mostly Africans. And then there is some other special immigrant visas, for instance, for the Afghan and Iraqi uh, people who had been working with our military and their adoption visas and other special visas and small amounts. But remember that there's limits of, placed on these by country, no more than 7% of this total 675,000 visas uh, can come from any single country. So you can't have like 500,000 people coming from Philippines or India. Those are countries which have a lot of people here, so there's a lot of backlog, but uh, you, there's only 7% of the total of those visas. Now, in addition to that, over and above the 675,000, if you are a spouse, a parent, or a minor child of US citizens, you can gain admission, and there isn't a limit on these. Uh, everybody comes, uh, becomes a lawful permanent resident, LPR. Um, many people still call these green cards. The cards, I've seen them, they're not green anymore, but um, we, we have, we allow, uh, LPRs or green card holders to work and live lawfully in the US. And after five years, they can apply for citizenship. Of course, there's the non-permanent visas for business or tourism or study, um, coming to college here or studying here. Next slide, please. So just a little bit more about DACA and TPS because we we're talking about them a lot. I mentioned that Obama set up DACA in 2012. So what is it? First of all, not all dreamers are DACA. Dreamers are those who came in as children, but they can't apply. First of all, they have to apply and they have to pay a fee and it's not cheap. It was, it was something like 475 and it was about to be raised to I think 800 or 750, but I think that's on hold. It has to be renewed every two years and you can't apply until you're 15. So, um, but this allowed those young people to work uh, many are already 30 or so, but it allowed them to work, to get educated, 
to drive legally get driver's license, but they still couldn't receive any federal benefits and they did not have a legal pathway to become lawful permanent residents. Uh, gradually, some states, I know Maryland was one case, allowed DACA students to pay in-state tuition instead of being treated as an outsider, even if they lived. But many states still actually don't allow in-state tuition. And a few states, a handful of states, actually don't allow DACA students to go to state institutions. Um, so right, right now, there's over 700,000 people who are DACA, but there are more who are dreamers uh, who haven't. For a while, actually, the uh, new applications were being denied by Trump. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but sometimes people didn't have money to renew, or there were various other reasons that they didn't renew. So temporary protected status, remember this started in 1990, but uh, the US designates a country as having serious conditions. And those then those nationals from that country who happen to be in the US can apply. Again, they have to apply. And they, they can stay here and lawfully work until that country status expires. Now that country status can be extended and it has been extended for a number. Of, uh, but there are a number of countries, 12 of them for which TPS had been granted temporary protected status for those nationals and those have expired. Um, but there are another 10 countries who are uh, still, still having uh, people here in, um, I think over 300, close to 400,000. And actually two more, well, those countries just quickly, if you want to know El Salvador, Haiti, Honduras, Nepal, Nicaragua, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, Syria, and Yemen are the 10 countries with current uh, TPS status. And Venezuela and Burma or Myanmar have actually just been uh, added as countries designated for TPS status. If we can move on to the next slide. So we'll, it's good to distinguish that we also do humanitarian admissions. Remember, uh, right after World War II, we started making legislation for uh, refugees. Refugees are people applying from outside the US and often they're in transition countries. Uh, people from might be in uh, uh, refugee camps in another country as in Bangladesh in the case of Burmese, of Myanmar, people of Rohingya. But displaced persons from outside have a process that they go through. It may take years, but they also they have to show this well-founded fear of persecution based on race, religion, political opinion, national origin, and membership in a particular group. They can apply for status, but we only admit a certain number every year. And the State Department has had contracts with a number of resettlement agencies, youth and immigration and refugee services, one highest is another, but uh, for many different, uh, well, for nine different resettlement agencies, I think it was, but annual caps were reduced dramatically in the last four years by Trump. We'll come back to this, but uh, the last year of Obama, the, re the refugee cap was 110,000. It was reduced to 15,000 by Trump, and even that was never reached because of extreme wedding. We'll get to that in a minute. In any case, this total is still divided into limits by global region. <clears throat> so you're not seeing the, um, again, you can't get 110,000 uh, uh, Haitians coming in. There has to be, or Rohingya coming in. There has to be a, a global balancing of these. Now, if people are already in the United States, they can seek protection on the same grounds of these well-founded fear of persecution. They have to apply at the entry, which is <clears throat> what is happening in the border. Many people applying and they step into the United States in a Customs and Border Patrol station and they apply for asylum. Or they could be within the US for other reasons. They could be here as a tourist or as a student or just be here even undocumented. They, if they apply within one year, that's, their, that's the limit at this point. And on those same grounds, we can consider them and give them asylee status. There isn't a cap placed on the number of asylees, uh, but in 2017, again, Obama's last year, 26,568 uh, asylees were approved. So it's not a huge number. Neither of these really are huge numbers in terms of uh, impact on our population. 
Next slide, please. Okay, I want to go through now and take three or four slides. It's gonna take that because even though there is no new immigration or refugee related legislation passed in the last four years, 2017 to 2020, the Trump administration drastically altered immigration and refugee processes. They took executive actions, they changed rules or tried to, they named personnel uh, to, that were anti-immigrant or, or determined to limit immigration they made, they put pressure on sending countries. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. All of this was aimed at reducing immigration and refugee resettlement. Now you will remember in his first week, uh, President Trump suspended entry from seven largely Muslim countries. Now he pretended this wasn't about their Muslim status, but it, everybody thought of it as a Muslim ban and the court challenges use some of his language to indicate that that was his intention. So that was one of the very first acts. He added refugee, uh, extreme vetting, as they called it, to uh, refugee admissions. So honestly, refugees get extremely vetted before. This just added more evidence, repeated evidence. It made much longer with the already several years long process of many cases of being considered a refugee and given the right to enter the US. And as I mentioned, he reduced the cap to almost nothing. 15,000 people is practically nothing. And uh, all of these other efforts, plus the pandemic made, uh, I don't, they didn't even, they, they didn't even reach the higher limit uh, last year. I think there was just uh, between 11 and 12,000 people who entered. He also halted refugees from high risk countries. So this was called the Africa ban. A number of them were from Africa and he, halted that, all of this not through legislation. Asylum was deeply, deeply undermined, much tighter restrictions. They started um, I think three years ago, this Remain in Mexico program, well, which was officially called the Migrant Protection Program, MPP. He tried to and did successfully uh, sign third country agreements. They tried to make Guatemala, for instance, uh, Please don't do that. <laughs> um, they tried to make Guatemala provide asylum. They wouldn't allow Salvadorans who pass through Guatemala on their way to Mexico and the US to uh, be admitted without uh, applying in, a, in a Guatemala for asylum. Now, at the time this, this agreement was signed, I understand the Guatemalan government had an eight person asylum unit. So they were not in a position to process these, but uh, we threatened the Trump administration threatened to cut off aid and made other pressure tactics to uh, force them to sign this agreement, which they did. And I think the other one was also Honduras was forced into that. For the first time with the uh, raising of USCIS trying to raise all its fees, they proposed for the first time a $50 fee to even apply for asylum. Now these people are in refugee camps, they don't have $50. Uh, I think there's only three other countries in the world that talk about a, paying a fee to apply for asylum. But anyway, that was proposed. Eventually the pandemic allowed the pretext of an emergency which existed in law title 42, uh, an emergency to be declared and all asylum was halted. So all these people who were kind of built up waiting at the Mexican border, metering it was called, uh, for their number to be called, which was sometimes months and months before they even had a hearing, before they were even allowed, this um, these people were not being called anymore. Next slide, please. Well, I think most of you have known about the family separation. In April 2018, uh, they, Jeff Sessions and the uh, Department of Justice and Trump Trump's White House decided to try zero tolerance. Anyone entering unlawfully would be prosecuted, but there is this long-standing law, the Flores Settlement, which doesn't allow children supposedly to be detained for more than 20 days, more than 72 hours in Border Patrol and more than 20 days in ICE uh, custody. So that was the pretext for separating children from the parents. And uh, in just two or three months by two, June, this 3,000 children have been forcefully separated from their parents. And this created such public outrage. Certainly we got in that 
the outrage movement too. And the administration was uh, back down and changed. Uh, but of course they had started this without adequate records. So they, the reunification of these separated children with their parents, and they'd been moved around and everything. This was uh, impossible really for some. There was still as of inauguration day this year, there were still around 500 children who had not been reunified. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, by the way, if you want a book about this uh, in some detail, this whole family separation, read Separated by Jacob Sabaroff, who's a, a journalist who wrote a recent book about it, Separated, it's called. Anyway, there was another diversity visas were suspended. Now, this was not legal, so court challenges prevailed, but this was a the you know, shithole country thing. He, he tried to suspend applications for diversity visas from, from African countries. And to, then he tried to freeze them because of the pandemic. But in any case, those were challenged in court. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so there were, there was this whole very devious way, you know, uh, laws are, well, while legislation might be 600 pages long, it still doesn't get into the details of how um, our departments of public federal departments are implementing those laws. So regulations have to be uh, developed and they hit on the idea of changing the regula regulations, the public rules to uh, be more punitive to immigrants. So one of the most widely talked about was the public charge. Now public charge for, means is somebody is determined to be likely or probable to rely in a major way, significant way on government support their entire life, those people are not allowed entry. And uh, remember way back a long time ago, how beggars were not allowed in. This is how long ago public charge rule. But these days until the public charge rule is attempted to be changed, they were just looking at like cash welfare payments as a measure of evidence of, of major reliance on government support, extended welfare payments and cash payments. But the rule was changed to uh, <clears throat> include Medicaid and uh, food stamps, which is SNAP, a lot of other public benefits. This had a very uh, harsh impact on the, on the uh, immigrant communities because it was very complex and nuanced and they didn't understand. So they just got the word, if you ever wanna be legal, don't use, Medicaid, don't use this, don't use that. But many, many people, when they come in, they need to use this and they're eligible for it initially uh, in, in a number of cases, but they, even if they were eligible, they kind of backed off. Now, um, when rules are changed, when regulations are changed, there is a government requirement for a period of public comment. Usually it's 60 days. Sometimes the Trump administration tried to get people through in uh, uh, rule change comments through in only 30 days in a couple of cases. But in any case, a, a lot of us advocacy agencies and US, USJ went to people and asked for individuals to make, to go online and make um, public comments opposing this. In spite of all those largely opposing comments, the um, departments involved went ahead and they were on the verge of making public charge uh, a permanent change, which would have taken months to undo, but that was one that was kind of caught it right at the moment, thanks to court challenges, uh, and and backed off. Uh, the Supreme Court was waiting for the Biden administration to say, "Yes, you know, uh, decide that this public charge is okay," and the, and the Biden administration said, "No, they were not going to." So that is the end of this uh, enhanced definition of of lack of, of eligibility to, to enter. A couple of other rule changes. <clears throat> One I was particularly incensed at, they require immigrants to do biometric, to provide biometric information, and they actually have to go and pay $80 to give that. Now, that was just adults, and it was more like fingerprints and facial recognition, but they tried to expand that to everybody, including little children, $80 a person and to expand the biometric information required to be much more intrusive. All of this, uh, that was another rule change. I think this again was, I'm not quite sure of the status of this, but I don't think it made it think that those are another ones. And another ridiculous one was housing subsidies for low income families 
had been uh, dealt with when you have a mixed status family where there's perhaps one person out of four in a household, maybe two children who are US citizens, maybe a, a green card adult. Um, in the past, this if you had one undocumented person in a four person household, you could get 75% of that subsidy rate. Well, the idea was to change the rules so that anybody with even one person in a household who was not properly documented wouldn't get wouldn't be eligible for any subsidy at all. So this is the way they used regulatory changes to be uh, to punish immigrants. There was a general denial of visas. You know, consular officers overseas are always always have the discretion to decide to give a visa or not. Um, so the kind of word went out to uh, tighten up your discretion. Anybody who might seem like a pregnant woman who is going to have her baby in the US, you could deny them. Uh, you could send skilled workers applying for visas and international students applying for study visas back for more and more and more evidence. And they did do that. Uh, denial of foreign worker visas went up fivefold, quintupled. And the number of students after a decade of growing, the number of international students coming to study in the US went down to 20,000 um, in 2019 after a decade of growth. Okay, next. Next slide. I wish this didn't have to be so long, but there was just so much that he did all outside of the legislative field. <clears throat> there was a huge slowdown in processing of green cards and of citizenship. And you already heard about extreme vetting, but the USCIS, the US uh, Citizenship and Immigration Service is supposed to be a service organization. And uh, the Trump administration tried to turn it into a third enforcement agency. They were allowed to deny applications for the slightest of reasons. If you were filling out a green card application, and I've helped uh, immigrants fill out these, so I know they're fairly lengthy, and you have to fill them out for every single person in your family. If you sent it in with a blank space, like you didn't have a middle name, uh, instead of writing N slash A, they could deny, they could reject that application. And they did as lawyers have come to find out. Overseas USCIS offices were closed down, interviews were mandated to be in person, but then they weren't allowed when the pandemic started. As I mentioned before, there were fee increases, significant fee increases proposed for every category. I think that's on hold, but now I talked about the Obama era uh, hierarchy of detention and deportation, there was a change that ICE was given free reign to detain and deport immigrants without any hierarchy. So before it was just your drug runners and your felons and your terrorists. And now they, can, they could just go anywhere. Anybody who they decided could be deported, there isn't a hierarchy. Uh, in fact, USCIS, if they decided to deny adjustment of status. So imagine you're in the US and you're applying to become a lawful permanent resident. You might, you're giving all of your contact information to USCIS. If you were denied, if USCIS decided to turn you down, they could order your deportation right away at the same time they turned you down and you just handed them all of your information. Notices to appear were unnecessarily issued. Uh, you probably read about all the people who already had green cards. These, the cases were reopened. All of this added a huge backlog. Uh, judges were given quotas. Imagine what that did to erode due process. If a judge is given a quota to meet, a number of hearings given, are they going to pay attention and be thoughtful in each hearing? Uh, you, now, ICE is rated, or their predecessors have rated factories and public places where a lot of immigrants were known to be uh, in the past, but this was a kind of a regular uh, event and it created fear, separated families. People with kids at school were detained, maybe both husband and wife. I mean, there were schools developing uh, agreements for what to do with children if the parents got deported, you know, who to send the children to. And I think you probably read in a number of cases about how wretched conditions were detention centers, particularly in the case of uh, after the pandemic, uh, people who were, people were just not provided PPE or the hygiene necessary or masks or anything to, uh, to prevent getting COVID. Um, 
I hadn't mentioned, but you know, a lot of the detention centers were not run by ICE, but were run by for-profit private corporations. So that's a whole other issue. But anyway, the conditions were notoriously bad and often some people who attempted, you know, members of Congress sometimes who attempted to visit were not allowed in. Detainees were also moved around from one place to another, different states, different coasts, they were moved around at will. But there was even a famous case where some border enforcement agents wanted to come to a rally in Washington. So they decided to charter a plane and move some folks that were down at the border in detention up to the Farmville, Virginia detention center, just so that they could be basically flown up without paying to attend the rally. So this is just willful abuse, I think. Next slide, please. We're not finished yet, <laughs> but this is the last slide on Trump. And then we're gonna have another pause for questions. Uh, Trump did attempt to terminate DACA. When he was a candidate, he was saying, oh, well, you know, that's the hardest one, DACA dreamers. I kind of have a little soft spot for dreamers, but in fact, they terminated DACA. They prohibited renewals, they prohibited new applicants, but court challenges started right away. They got to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said that for administrative process reasons, uh, it, what, the uh, termination was not legitimate. So DACA stayed active. And, but even though the court, Supreme Court had ruled, the USCIS still refused to accept new applications. Now, as you know, this is, this is changing. I'll get to that in a minute uh, with the new administration. But um, up to a point, DACA was released. Even though the Supreme Court had decided in their favor, it was potentially could have happened if Trump had been reelected that they had re uh, submitted a termination with proper administrative process. So anyway, uh, they also tried to terminate TPS by not extending the expiration dates of the country designation as they came up. But again, those challenges kept renewals authorized until, until the court, they always felt it was fair to give TPS holders six months to prepare to leave after they've been here 20 years to go back. So they were always giving like an extra six months. And at this point, most of those renewal dates are <clears throat> in this year, 2021. So TPS people are not out of the woods yet, but anyway, things are looking better. Now the famous wall, you know, the big beautiful wall that Mexico was gonna pay for, and of course didn't. And then the Congress didn't provide enough money to build that beautiful wall. So the Trump administration basically applied an emergency declaration in order to take money from defense, the Defense Department and uh, FEMA and other agencies and put it on the border wall construction. It, and they ended up hiring a number of contractors. So there are contractors with legitimate contracts with the US government. Very few new barriers, only 15 miles really of new, brand new wall was constructed by the time of the inauguration of Biden. Uh, but another several hundred wall uh, of replacement and secondary walls were built. So uh, this is going to be a struggle to figure out how to get out of those construction contracts. And finally, I think from the beginning, even from the campaign period, negative narr narratives were promoted by the Trump administration. You know, bad hombres, rapists, animals. They used the idea of catch and release a lot. You know, oh, we're just going to, the idea of not detaining people was and releasing them into the community meant that they would disappear and never show up. In fact, there's a very interesting study uh, which the detailed resource guide you'll get uh, just published. The Amer American Immigration Council did a study on uh, immigration immigrants showing up for their court hearings. Immigrants with lawyers showed up 96% of the time for their court hearings. And this is in spite of sloppy notice procedures. Uh, the, administrations were, were very uh, notable for sending notices to the past addresses and immigrants move around a lot too and but they would submit their new address but it didn't I have personal experience with um, USCIS not recording a new address sending green cards to the, the, the last address even weeks after they acknowledged receiving an address change so notices of hearings were were very sloppy okay I'm going to stop here and turn it over again to Terry Krogan and Pablo for any questions that are in the chat. Okay, I see uh, four questions in the chat. Um, the first one was under current law, is there a permanent resident kind of status without 
a path to citizenship. Does anyone on the team want to take that one on? Well, I mean, both uh, DACA and TPS are, are lawful. They're temporary. They're both temporary, but they are lawful status. They're not permanent. I think this was getting at the per permanent status category. Yeah. Um, so no, as far as I know. Sean, do you know, without a path to citizenship? DACA and TPS no, no, don't no, right no. now have a path to citizenship, but. Uh, uh, no, that's why, yeah, there's, as you point out, apparently you can reopen some of these things. If you're a lawful permanent resident on a, on a, and you have, you have to wait a certain number of years, I, I forget what it is now, five years or. It's usually you know, five, but there's a few special cases of three. Yeah. Um, then, you know, uh, there is the possibility so until you're a citizen, they, they, there's always a possibility that you will um, commit a crime like, you know, DUI or some other crime that is considered to be a uh, aggravated uh, felony and you then risk being uh, deported because uh, you're, you're not a citizen. You're still an alien. But, but there's at least a path. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're once you're a lot level permanent residency, you're on a you're on a path. You're, you're, okay. You're, the you're, next question was talking about uh, the 675,000 visas. How long does it take to get one? And in particular, the the questioner was curious about what about for families of U.S. citizens. I know Charlotte, you alluded to the backlog, which has become a real issue. The immigration processing of um, many kinds of paperwork of this type have become a real problem, but I don't know specifically about visas. Does anyone have information on that? I think Sean may have, but it, it depends on the nationality because, because they are limited within the 675,000, because they're limited um, to no more than 7% of that total by nationality, where they have huge quantities applying, say from India or Philippines, yeah. It, yeah. it takes longer. Anybody so those folks get backed up because of that country limit. But if uh, but other nationalities might get through in this time. Okay, if, if no one else wants to weigh in on this, we had two questions, I think, that get to the, uh, the Remain in Mexico issue, the uh, uh, so-called MPP. One is, how many people are still being held by that policy? My understanding is that uh, folks in the southern border are being admitted in, in small numbers uh, since the new administration came in, but I don't know what the backlog is of folks still waiting in camps and other situations down there. If there, anyone have any data on that? My recollection is it's something in the neighborhood of 10 or 20,000. Like I, yeah, I, right at the border, um, I actually know, but I don't, I don't remember. It's, it's, a t it's tens of thousands, which is still a lot, but a lot of people right. went further south in Mexico or they even went back uh, to, so the ones who came initially, uh, so it's in the kind of five digit number. And then a second question kind of on the same general topic, how can we legally demand that another country, Mexico in this case, house and look after migrants seeking US admission? I think the answer is that we legally didn't do that. We just said, we're not going to process them and we're turning them back. And I understand there were some administrative attempts to work with the Mexican government to have them pick up some of the slack, but I'm not sure you could say we forced them to uh, house and look after folks. I don't know, do other people have a, a take on that? Well, I think we had agreements with them. Uh, we have with agreements with Mexico. I mean, you know, the question of legally, uh, I suspect that uh, this was like everything else that Trump did uh, almost everything was li was litigated, and I no, I, I don't know where the litigation on MPP stands, but uh, the, the Trump administration threatened tariffs on Mexico if they if they didn't uh, stop try to stop immigrants at the southern border of Mexico, and also I think that's one way also mm -hmm. of encouraging them to go, you know house the people at the border. Yeah, the Biden administration, I understand, is trying is asking. Uh, quietly, but they're asking uh, Mexico to try to stop people at their southern at Mexico's southern border. And, you know, it's, it's, it's actually a number of administrations have tried to get Mexico to do that. But yeah, yeah. So Ruth Cassidy says, and it is right. Not every green card holder ends up getting citizenship. Uh, of course, I mean the question was if did they have a pathway to it earlier? But 
but it's very good to point out that not every green card holder ends up getting citizenship. Sean mm -hmm. mentioned, first of all, you have to apply, you have to pass the test. And, and, uh, you have to pay a big fee, you have to pass a medical exam. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 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 there was that- Background there checks. Is, there still is the public charge uh, thing that comes up, even though it's, it's not the same. I mean, you know, it doesn't, it's not as widely applicable anymore. Um, <laughs> Uh, lots of, but I, you know, I think, but I think that you know that uh, I suspect that the de the delays recently have been just just delays in processing because the the, the grounds for challenging people once they've gotten le legal public permanent residence, uh, you know, they're, they're they're not that extensive. I think we should also hold up another comment by Ruth Cassidy, which I think is important on the subject of getting citizenship. She said. Getting things resolved often is dependent on access to good lawyers, which many immigrants do not have. And my understanding is that that's exactly right, that that makes all the difference in terms of the chance of success. So I wanted to share that comment. Yeah, besides the fees you pay, you, you pay a lawyer. Yeah, and, and hey. good, good lawyer is a good question because they, you know the, in the immigration area, I have to say, my impression is that this is an area where there are a lot of people who hold themselves out as immigration lawyers who really don't know what they're doing. And, uh, and so there, there are a lot of problems. I do want to mention that, you know, in terms of the Remain in Mexico program, you have to remember the global context at that point. Uh, you know, the policy stimulated the, the personalities and uh, threads in the Mexican community who were interested in sort of um, anti-immigrant behavior within Mexico. So, so, so the policy found purchase with some personalities, especially some that were connected to global U.S. firms who had business interests in Mexico. So there's a complicity here that, you know, the, the forces that brought this policy to bear found their friends globally, and certainly in Mexico. I think we better go on because it's yeah. to nine, so we could... Uh... Move on to the last, the next slide. Uh, we will have some brief question period at the end. So what's going on now? Okay, so candidate Biden uh, developed a platform. He had a lot of people working on what he was gonna do on day one uh, in his first hundred days. He said he was gonna reverse a lot of these punitive orders and he was gonna send a comprehensive bill. Uh, he said that he wanted a fair and humane uh, immigration system. So uh, when he was inaugurated, the very afternoon of his inauguration, he actually signed orders on quite a few orders on immigration. He ended the uh, Muslim and uh, African travel bans. He, I forgot to mention this, but uh, Trump was trying to uh, get people, undocumented people excluded from the 2020 census, which we were just completing. Um, but that he ended that. Um, order. He ended the emergency that allowed Trump to divert funds to the border wall. He established a, an order to protect and fortify DACA, meaning it could go forward, new people could apply. I didn't mention because it only applies to Liberians, but he also signed an order to protect uh, Liberians who had a TPS kind of arrangement called deferred and forced departure. And he did sign a moratorium on deportation for 100 days. Unfortunately, a Texas judge immediately declared that was not uh, acceptable. And so that an injunction stopped. And in fact, several, ICE sent several planes of people, deported several planes full of people, even after Biden issued that order and tried to put a moratorium on. And the same day as he was inaugurated, he sent his proposal for comprehensive immigration reform to Congress. Uh, he had arranged already for Menendez of New Jersey and Sanchez of California to introduce it in each house. So next slide, please. He took a couple of other actions just a few weeks later. Um, he did. He had promised and he did create a task force to reunite separated children. Remember there were those 500 children who had yet to be reunited, um, creating a task force is kind of a famously bureaucratic way to delay. But in fact, there were reasons these people, these children were still not united. They had lost track of parents because of the lousy record keeping or their lack of record keeping. 
And they still need to figure out whether they're going to invite the families here to reunite or send the children back to their to wherever their parents are or the family members are. He, he also signed another executive action talking about his intent to address root causes. This is something that was in the uh, Obama Biden period, and they actually had three quarters of a billion dollars uh, appropriated for addressing root causes in Central America, but Trump stopped that. Uh, they intend to collaborate with partners to address asylum seeker needs. And those partners, by the way, they're not just governments, but they are uh, NGOs and international organizations. And he also wants to try to find uh, ways, legal avenues for eligible Central American migrants. In particular for minors, he's looking at a way that Central American minors who might have a family member here and be legitimately eligible to come here could apply from their home countries instead of making that dangerous trek through Mexico. He's, another order is to review the Remain in Mexico or Migrant Protection Protocol and find ways to deal with the backlog. And I know that they have started, as Terry was saying, they've started uh, processing some in a particular uh, border towns of waiting asylum seekers on the Mexican side. Um, but it, again, it's that's a process. They have to get people back. They may have to retrain them. They may have to, uh, we send the obstacles to asylum. They have to do a whole lot of things and it isn't easy. Uh, and I know most of you have been reading the paper every day about the surge of new people to the border. So anyway, that's another kind of- Please be the aware thing. that the PBS news- Yeah. Uh, well, there's been a lot of news on that. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, he's reestablished a task force on new Americans. Now there's a whole lot of people come in. They don't just need legal services. Uh, they may have family members here, but they may need language services. They may need help finding uh, employment. Uh, they may, especially if they're refugees who don't have people here, they may need cultural orientation on how they can be included. So they may be here legitimately and lawfully, but they may need, uh, help to provide, uh, to, to become more integrated and inclusive. He also planned to review all immigration, all regulations because he wants, you know, there are so many regulations now, we haven't had a comprehensive reform in so long. Uh, and he's designated the White House as the coordination point. Next slide, please. So just quickly, I'm gonna go through, this is a major bill. I call it the big Biden bill, US Citizenship Act of 2021. It was introduced a few days later in February 18th uh, in the House and in the Senate. And it was immediately referred to Judiciary Committee and probably to others. But uh, the most talked about element of it is creating citizenship for all the nearly 11 million undocumented immigrants who are in the US. Not anybody who arrived from January 1st onward, but, um, and. It, it's quite interesting because it creates a kind of a new semi kind of purgatory uh, status. But for those who have DACA, TPS, and farm worker authorizations, they actually have an expedited process. They could apply for green cards right away under this if it were passed. He's also taking a step to try to change the narrative instead of saying alien, which is a legal term, but for us, it's, it becomes, it has become such a a negative term, we will start using non-citizen. I mean, another thing I didn't mention was under Trump, they cleared the website of all sorts of things like, you know, USCIS used to talk about the United States as a nation of immigrants. They made USCIS get, it, get that language out of its website. So language is really important. They also have a component in that bill, which, you know, remains to be passed, of course, to um, not allow any future president to ban entry based on religion as it appears that Trump tried to do. They wanted to increase diversity visas, uh, promoting integration and inclusion, reduce the backlog of employment related visas. Oh, so many businesses are going to support that. Next slide, please. Try to get rid of the backlog in general. Uh, besides improving employer verification, they, you know, many workers who come in are brought in by one and only one employer and if they, are exploited by that and want to move, they, they can't. So they, they want to protect workers from ex exploitation by the employers, even if they've gotten in with a, an employment visa. Of course, they have the element of enforcement, enforcing border control because that's the only way it'll even be looked at by some of the uh, members of Congress, but they wanted to focus 
smart border technology on uh, smugglers and traffickers of narcotics and, and contraband and humans, of course. They need to train, I would say, retrain border agents. I'm sure border agents are trained, but right now they have, you know, the, the mentality has been pushed on them for the last four years of uh, being defending our border from anybody crossing. They've created, they plan to create a stakeholder advisory committee. Now, there used to not be anybody you could complain to if um, Border Patrol or uh, Rice had a, did things in a way that was abusive, but this is a, a kind of an ombuds like advisory committee that stakeholders, especially border communities, could, uh, could use. Of course, standards of care for family and children who are detained. Uh, Addressing the root causes, we mentioned that earlier, minors can apply to reunite from the home country, getting rid of those court backlogs and uh, restoring some of the judicial discretion that had been taken away, judges training more judges, a number of judges left, I think I would have been too if I had been a judge. Uh, providing counsel, you know, immigrants don't have the right to public defenders like uh, criminals in the US do, that count or accused criminals alleged criminals, but this uh, there is an element of providing counsel to children and vulnerable individuals too in that US Citizenship Act. Next slide, please. There are some things that this beautiful bill doesn't do. I mean, we support it anyway, but uh, it doesn't really reduce these criminal bars and the number of uh, partner agencies, our uh, advocacy agencies are not thrilled, they're not fully supporting this because they continue the expanded definition of inadmissibility. Like if you get two DUIs, for instance, or even crossing the border outside of a port of entry is you know, a misdemeanor. Even having two misdemeanors, suppose you are accused of shoplifting, but you haven't really even shoplifted or something. It's very, anyway, you could easily have two, two misdemeanors if you've been here for 20 years, especially with our racist and biased uh, criminal justice system. Anyway, uh, so this is not dealt with really. It continues with this expanded definition of inadmissibility. Uh, and it really creates two, uh, or it creates a category of, of uh, citizens that are, are of uh, residents that are not having the same rights as other citizens, other residents. Uh, they, border communities in particular are not very happy with the smart monitoring technology that is being proposed because they find it intrusive uh, and it kind of normalizes having drones flying over you all the time and people being stopped and picked up whether they're US citizens who just happen to look a little Mexican or what. And then we didn't talk about this too much but it doesn't rescind the three and 10 year bans. Um, if you're in the US and you say you overstay your tourist visa and um, by 180, like let's say 190 days, but not 365 days. If you then go back and try to apply for legal entry, maybe you have a fiance by that time who's a, who made you not wanna leave after all, but if you've been here unlawfully and go home and try to come back, you have a three year ban, you can't apply for three years. If you stay unlawfully more than a year after you, then that's a 10 year ban. Next slide, please. So those are issues they don't deal with. Um, so, you know, there's going to be a challenge getting this through the Senate. I think it's possible there could even be a challenge uh, getting it through the House, but uh, hopefully that could happen. But getting it through the Senate is with 60 votes required, as you all know, because of the filibuster. There, there, there are a number of people who support this big bill, but they're also reintroducing uh, some of their past bills from last Congress. So with the Dream and Promise Act in the House, HR 6, that was passed two years ago and it's just been passed again. So now it's once again in the Senate that provided for legal pathways for, for citizenship for both DACA and TPS. Now the Dream Act and in the Senate, they, for technical reasons, they were divided before and they have been divided again. The Dream Act has been reintroduced and I saw this week that uh, Senator Durbin thinks he may be close to getting the votes to pass that. Now that had bipartisan, Lindsey Graham and Durbin had, and they had a balanced bipartisan support for that, but for the DACA people. Our Senator from Maryland, Van Hollen, has uh, reintroduced his SECURE Act, which deals with TPS in a similar way. 
And there was Farm Workforce Modernization Act, which is uh, again reintroduced. This provided for some interesting, um, more permanent visas, not permanent, but longer and more flexible visas for farm workers. There are several others that are listed there uh, that are being reintroduced by the same people. Uh, Representative Pramila Jayapal is one of the famous uh, supporters of immigration. She's an immigrant herself from Washington state. So she's introduced, I think, a number of these, but, and then there's this new proposal related to COVID that essential workers, which uh, actually number close to 5 million out of those 11 million, including dreamers and DACA and farm workers, but a few more essential workers in frontline that are health workers and others. New proposal has been up for citizenship, providing at least 5 million of the 11 million who are called essential workers, and it defines them. Now, this is a proposal that I think it's Congressman Padilla was going to uh, introduce. And initially they were hoping it could be attached to the COVID relief bill or to perhaps the upcoming economic recovery and infrastructure bill that is being talked about that might go through reconciliation needing only 51 votes. But anyway, that's kind of a lot of detail. So these are piecemeal. They don't get all the way there and it creates a certain um, uncertainty for people like us who want to advocate. You know, should, if we advocate for the piecemeal ones and uh, some of those go through, does that take the pressure off passing the big one? This is uh, fodder for a lot of discussion. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we're almost finished. I wanna allow a few more questions. Now we had progress, we had priorities. We are sharing them in our uh, resource guide and we'll come back to them in our April 28th town hall discussion. But just quickly, uh, we had priorities about getting all those harmful rule changes we mentioned, public charge and others. Now, some of that is taken care of. The public charge one, the other, I'm not sure. Reinstating DACA, that's been taken care of. Reversing the MPP, well, that's technically reversed, but uh, you know they have to work on it. Reversing the Muslim ban, that's happened. Raging, raising the refugee cap, well, President Biden has stated that he intends to do this, but then he hasn't signed it. Originally, he stated right away 125,000 in next fiscal year, it was already said at 15,000 for this. And a lot of people are asking to raise that to 62,500 for this year. He has not signed off on either one. Um, as we mentioned, there was action. One of our priorities was to, uh, to stop deportation and that was uh, proposed, but the Texas judge stopped it. Then there's those that are, it's not clear, there seem to be action underways, but we understand they do take more time uh, reviewing the TPS countries and extending them where possible until they get some legal pathways available through perhaps passage of the SECURE Act or perhaps the, um, the big Biden bill. Reopening the borders to asylum seekers, well, you know that, and reducing backlogs that if anything seems to have created more backlogs. Ending the border wall construction, well, he says he intends to do that, but they have to work out those contracts. Reuniting separated children, he's giving that a lot of attention. Writing the basis for asylum and providing right to counsel. Those are things where there's intention stated, but the, you know it's going to be medium term action, I think. A couple places where we haven't been able to see progress. Um, obviously, all those other uh, undocumented immigrants besides the DACA and TPS and farm workers, ceasing private detention contractors. Uh, we would love to see all detention stopped, but using community-based alternatives to detention, that's very proven effective, much, much less costly to taxpayers and much, much more humane <laughs> to release them. But we don't have, uh, we haven't seen much language about that. Strengthened oversight of DHS. Well, I have to say, Alejandro Mayorkas was there in Homeland Security uh, hearing in the House last week, I believe it was. You know, for year, for quite a while, nobody from DHS even bothered, even though they were summoned by Benny Thompson, the head of the chair of that committee, Homeland Security Committee in the House. They wouldn't go and testify. So, at least Mayorkas is there testifying. But uh, oversight is something DHS really needs. Next slide. <clears throat> Just some ideas about what we can do. Uh, well, UUSJ advocates at the federal level. Others like UU Legislative Ministry, we have one in Maryland. There's uh, similar ones in other states. You can advocate with lawmakers at local, state, and federal levels. 
on any of these issues, uh, we're happy to have you join us. Uh, by the way, our email is on the front uh, of this slide package, which you will get, and you're free to in, uh, advise us if you'd like to join, either express, get more uh, information from time to time, or even join our committee. <clears throat> you can go to town halls, you can send letters, emails, you can follow our action alerts, and many other uh, organizations are providing you just, you know, with the click of your uh, button at your mouse, you can send an action alert to your members of Congress. You can call them, but not too many people are answering their phones right now. You can join or financially support organizations. Again, uh, there's a list of them and the uh, information we'll be sending you, but many of them are providing services to immigrants and others are doing a wonderful job of research and advocacy. You can sponsor adults or minors who need help resettling and integrating, and we can give you more information. Now, some people have family members here, but some people won't be allowed out of detention unless 